they did a research in the South Bronx at the beginning of the 90s. And I wrote my research in this book that you see the cover there. And actually, the research was done in the, this is the Bronx, and this is the place, the Ants Point district in the Bronx where I did the research. And it is a very important experience in my life because there I discovered the connection between humor, listening, and a participatory approach to urban planning. And also, more generally, I understood the need for an upgrade of democracy, for upgrading our political life in the 21st century. So, humor. I give an example of, to show you, to illustrate the relationship between humor and listening. Here there is a clip by Mark Twain, who says, uh, it is not true that uh, it is hard to stop smoking. I just stop every day. <laughs> and uh, this the first part of the center, everybody understands that I, it is not hard to stop to give up smoking. But then the punchline, another frame of interpretation comes up, and it is, I can stop every day. I can, I can give up, I can continue to smoke and give up every day. So, uh, that is why you laugh, because you are taken aback by the punchline, and you see that there is another interpretation that you, before you thought it was not uh, there, it was not possible. Now, this kind of, uh, of pattern and dynamics is very useful, not only in humor, but in uh, jokes, but in everyday life. In now, to understand everyday life in a global world, you need the, to know that you cannot uh, um, exclude the, the unexpected. You have to keep an open mind. You have to be ready to be surprised. And uh, also, you need to laugh at yourself because you are going always to be trapped into an interpretation that you feel it is the right one. And to get out of the cage, you need some humor. You need to see yourself also from the outside. So that is why uh, you must be trained in humor to understand life in general. When I went to the Bronx, I was very anxious, so I wrote three rules, which were, are here, the, what became the first three rules of seven of the art of listening. And these rules were, first one, never be in a rush to interpretation, never be hurry to reach conclusions, be open to a new interpretation. The second one, which is very important, is what you are seeing depends on your point of view. To see your point of view, you need to change it. So two points of view contrasting are better than one, and three are better than two. And uh, so to understand something which is complex, you need to look at it from many points of view, not only one. That's it. And the last of the three rules is the most, the more difficult because it says, that if you want to understand what another person says, you must think that she is intelligent, that she is right. Even if you do not agree, you must think, how come she thinks that she is right? And by doing that, you do not renounce to your own point of view. Both are right. And try to understand something new from this. So with this methodological baggage, I went to the Bronx and I met these people, or the people of this committee, 
who was famous because they succeeded in uh, rebuilding their neighborhood, making it a safe place. And I wanted to understand how they did it. So th their name, the name of their organization was Banana Kelly Community Organization. And it was called like that because they, their, the first place where they met was uh, Kelly Street. And Kelly Street, uh, as you can see from one of these paintings up there, has a shape of a banana. So that's why they call it themselves Banana Kelly. Already that name gave me the idea that they had a kind of a sense of humor. <laughs> also, if you can see, there is a mural there, up there, uh, where kids are playing. That was the whole wall in Kelly Street with that mural. And uh, actually, as soon as I met them, I spent three months all the day long staying with them, uh, I discovered that they were using humor, active listening, even alternative dispute resolution, which I didn't know what it was, all the time. All the time. I give you a couple of examples. Of, they were using the unpleasant incidents of the Bronx uh, to make life uh, more to, to find the solidarity, hope, uh, and to, for laughter. So, just a couple of little examples of their communications. One of these women was a hairdresser. So she would come and say, you know what happened today? I was just fixing the hair of a client, and she told me, today I'm not going to pay you because I need to go shopping. What? She was going shopping with my money. Now, everybody was laughing about it. And they thought. Another woman, another, her name is Annie, came and said, the last night at midnight, the bus was not uh, arriving. So I, I got into a van, the private van, and go around to the Bronx for one dollar and bring you everywhere. And the driver was driving like crazy. And they were so frightened that they said, I will never do this experience in my own life again. And one of the women, other women in the van started praying aloud. And, and Pearl, another woman of the committee, says, that's when you, are get, you get really scared, when another person starts praying aloud. So they were again laughing and so on. And so what I learned by staying with them and uh, asking about their own experience are the four secrets to change a crisis area into a safe neighborhood. And these the secrets are the first one, they are very precious, very important even nowadays. The first one is, uh, let me see if we can get to the secrets. Here it is. The main actor of the transformation must be the inhabitants themselves. So they said that when we were building our own houses, that were, they were destroyed, they were a uh, uh, disaster, a <laughs> human disaster, they tried, started to rebuild them themselves with some architects helping them and so on. We were building our identity, our responsibility as citizen, our social fabric, and nobody could do that in our place. So all we needed was to be helped to help ourselves. And that is the first secret, and even valid nowadays. The second one is when you have so many problems, you have to redo the whole neighborhood. You do not ask where do we start from? What do we do? First you must ask who should we invite? Only when all the diversity of experiences, of points of view, of people living in the territory is there, and we listen to each other, to our different needs, perspectives, and so on, then we are ready to ask 
where are we going to start from, what we, we are going to do. That is another very important rule that if they had followed this rule in Italy, we would, would have avoided a lot of uh, planning disasters. And I think some of them you have in mind. I don't need to, to talk about them. So the next point is, the th third secret is beware of paternalism. But beware of paternalism not only of the institution, social, economic, uh, political, but even more so within your own organization to avoid to get in little groups fighting one against the other. And what is, how do you fight against paternalism within your own organization? And the uh, answer was substituting, by substituting dialogue to debate. We should learn how to dialogue instead of debating. Debate is, in debate, diversity becomes lining up with one position or the other while in dialogue you create new possibilities and you look for creative new solutions. And so that is uh, what they did. And that is very important too. The last secret is uh, the ABCD combination. And this was taken for a book by Fritz Schumacher. The title is Small is Beautiful and Wonderful. We, uh, book full of wisdom, and which these new urban pioneers knew. They had a small bibliography, but very well chosen. And the, this combination says that we should not have an, an approach top-down, neither top-down nor uh, bottom-up. We must work, collaborate with all those people who are care about uh, the, the kind of problems we deal with. So if be there in the top, middle, bottom, we don't care, but we must have people from the administration, people who care, not the official representatives, eh? from the administration, from business, from communication field, because communicating is very important, and from democratic organization, women's organization, ecological, trade unions, whatever. Churches, and so on. So, if you, every time that you put together this kind of diversity of expertise and people, you find that problems which looked impossible become possible. You find new solutions, creative solutions. So this is what I learned in the Bronx. And for the last uh, 30 years, I've been teaching and also being a practitioner in the field in many Italian towns, doing experiences of uh, participatory programs of requalifi urban requalification. And uh, so, and also I, a lot of people are doing the same, luckily in Italy and in the world. This kind of approach is growing. The next step should be an upgrade of political life. You, the, to change from debate to dialogue should become a kind of rule inside the institutions, not only for people who work outside. So the, the upgrading should be to go from the right to speak to also, not to the right to be listened to, from the right to debate to also the right to multiply options, from the right to majority vote to the right to participatory approach to listening to all the people who are interested. And why, if it is so effective to behave like this, to be organized like this, we do not do it. We, it is not done. I think the answer is fear. The people in power, the bosses <laughs> everywhere, but also everybody, are afraid 
that if they give space to diversity, they are going to lose control. Chaos will dominate. Huh? And they are right, actually. If they don't know how to listen, if they don't know how to use a humoristic approach to life, if they don't know anything about alternative dispute resolution, actually, diversity becomes chaotic, and, and that, that's it. But reality is enough chaotic even now, so it isn't. But anyway, uh, so what you need to do is to learn these capabilities, which are the elementary capabilities for effective decisions, uh, and also for transparency, and also for uh, a better moral world. These are some of the towns, uh, wait, here. Here are some of the towns where I've been working, Matera, Bari, Bolzano, Venice, Bologna, Modena, Livorno, Torino, Milano, and I've been doing experiences similar to the one uh, that I learned, I saw in the Bronx. And I hope that this is going to go on the same way. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much.